was about the ninth or tenth year of his reign. She was Jewish, she was young, and she lived about the middle of Caesar Augustus' reign. She lived in a town called Nazareth, in the area of northern Israel called Galilee. She was betrothed, that is, legally bound to be married to a local carpenter named Joseph. Her name was, as you can guess, Mary. And she had the shock of her life when the angel of God, Gabriel, appeared to her and told her that she'd been chosen by Yahweh God for a special purpose. This was a purpose that no other woman had ever been given. She was to give birth to the Messiah. The one whom the Old Testament prophets said would come and be anointed with the Holy Spirit and who would bring in the reign of everlasting righteousness and peace. Today, I want us to consider this passage in Luke chapter 1 regarding this young Jewess, as we call a female Jew, named Mary. What kind of person was she? How was she related to Yahweh God, the God of the Hebrews, who is the God of the whole earth and the universe and heaven? So through the scriptural revelation that we'll look at today, we're going to get an insight into her mind and heart, see what kind of person she was. Why would this be of interest to us? Well, it's because she was the one, along with her husband Joseph, who would have had the most influence on Jesus as he grew from infancy to a teenager and into adulthood. Well, you may remember that uh, in the earlier part of Luke's Gospel, which we read today, actually, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her the Holy Spirit would overshadow her and she would conceive a male child in her womb. And Gabriel told her about this child. He says in Luke 1.32, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now these are no small words, no small description. Mm -hmm. This is a great person who... Mary will have the privilege of giving birth to. Well, <clears throat> Mary knew she was a virgin. But she submitted to the purpose of God for her life. And we read this key sentence in Luke 138. She said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. After this happened, Mary left Nazareth, and she hurried up to the hill country to visit a relative of hers named Elizabeth, who had become pregnant in her old age by a miracle of God. And when Mary heard, or rather Elizabeth heard Mary come into the house, she said, When the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Amen. It's John the Baptist in her womb. And blessed is she who has believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So Mary, uh, Elizabeth knew that Mary had received and accepted this calling, this purpose that the Almighty God had sovereignly given to her. And then Mary breaks out in a psalm, or a psalm of praise to God, and she says in Luke 1, 46, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. 
from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And then it says, Mary remained with her, with Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her home. So what happened here? God had come to Mary, and through the angel Gabriel had told her of this personally earth-shaking event that was taking place in her life. But what was happening to her would not only impact her life from then on, but it was going to impact the world. Mm -hmm. A cosmic event brought about by Almighty God was happening through a young Jewish maiden. Her life would never be the same, nor would the world ever be the same. God was entering into human history in a way he had never done so before. The second person of the triune God was taking upon himself our human nature so that he might live among us, that he might know our joys and sorrows, our temptations and heartaches, to become a sacrifice in our place. He would ultimately suffer death on the cross as a payment for our sins. He came to pay the debt that we owe to God that we could not pay. His life was a sacrifice in place of us. He suffered the wrath of God that was directed against us. What we deserved was eternal punishment for our sins. But what God gave us through His Son was the opposite. He gave us the gift of eternal life and forgiveness. And so, in the conception of this child in the womb of Mary, the cosmic events were now set in motion. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Let's pray. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for these events that we read about in your holy word. These events that actually happened in the lives of these people. And through them, in particular through Mary, your purpose and plan for the redemption and salvation of your people was beginning to be accomplished. It was your purpose and your plan that was being carried out so that you might redeem and rescue a people out of a lost and sinful human race to bring them out and make them your own beloved people, to be their God and to make us your people. Guide us today as we examine your word. Impact our lives with your truth. May the same Holy Spirit who overshadowed Mary also overshadow our lives to teach us your truth, to impact us and accomplish your purpose through each of us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 There's no doubt that Mary was an amazing young woman. What's amazing about her is her piety. What do we mean by piety? Well, we don't often hear that word in our culture, but it speaks of her devotion to God and to His purposes. She was truly a pious young Jewish maiden. By maiden, another word we don't use much anymore, it just means a young woman, usually an unmarried woman. So, pious is a word that we use to describe Mary. The dictionary says 
A pious person is a person who's marked by or showing reverence for God and devotion to divine worship. Or another dictionary says that pious means having or showing a dutiful spirit of reverence for God or an earnest wish to fulfill religious obligations. Well, I think pious is a good word to describe Mary. She was a very serious person in her devotion to God and to his will for her life. Now, we don't know exactly how old she was, but we believe she was probably a pretty young woman, maybe 16, 17, 18, somewhere in that age range. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, our Lord, was, of course, the most pious person who ever lived. Uh, he was totally devoted and committed to pleasing his Heavenly Father and fulfilling his Father's will for his life. So let's look at this Jewish maiden, this pious young woman, and learn what we can about her devotion to God. The Apostle Paul told us to follow him as he followed Christ. The same can be said about Mary, as she followed God, let us follow her. As she was devoted to God, let us also be devoted to God. <clears throat> there are basically five things I want to say about Mary today. First of all, her obedience to God. When Mary learned what was happening, when she got her head together about what the angel had said to her, and she realized that this is real, this is really happening, what was her response? She didn't say, oh God, do you know what you're doing? She didn't say, no, I can't, I can't accept this. I have plans to be married to Joseph. This is going to mess up the plans. No, she said, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Be it to me according, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now let's understand her circumstances. She was betrothed to Joseph. She was a virgin. And she would soon begin to show signs of being pregnant. What was Joseph going to think? What would her family think? What about her friends and the people of Nazareth? She would be the talking stock of the town. Perhaps in an instant, all these thoughts flashed across her mind. But she put them aside. She knew God had come to her. And she immediately submitted to his word and to his will. She recognized by the Spirit of God that he was ordaining these things and he impressed the reality of them upon her mind and heart. And she could not chafe, she could not rebel at the will of God. She knew from the scriptures that one day a virgin would conceive. She read it in Isaiah 7, 4, 14. Who would bear a child who would be the anointed one of God, the Messiah, the Christ. She recalled I think at that time or sometime around there, I, the words of Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Perhaps in those seconds when the angel had spoken to her, other thoughts were going through her mind, flashed across her mind of other people in the Hebrew faith, the history of her people who had also been called to obey God. There was Noah who obeyed God and built a great ark on dry, dry land when there was no sign of a flood. But he obeyed God. There was Abraham who obeyed God and went to a strange land. And another time, in obedience to God, he took his son Isaac up on Mount Moriah 
and was going to offer him as a sacrifice to God as he raised his knife. God intervened and provided a ram instead. But he obeyed God. He believed that even if he killed his son, God would raise him from the dead. We read in Hebrews. And there was Moses who put aside his misgivings about returning to Egypt when God called him from the burning bush. He obeyed God. He was obedient. He went back to Egypt and he led his people out of Egyptian slavery. And there was Daniel who refused to obey the king's command to quit praying to any god except his god. And so he continued to pray to Yahweh openly three times a day. He obeyed God rather than man. There were others. There was people like Jeremiah who continued to prophesy the truth of the coming destruction of Jerusalem even though he was thrown into a cistern told to shut up. So these were Mary's fathers in the faith. She followed in this holy line of godly people who had been called by God to obey him. And they obeyed. She must follow their footsteps. She must obey her God. His will for her, in spite of the cost perhaps to her own personal reputation, her, God's will was supreme. She must obey him. She must submit to his will. There really was no other choice. Oh, great and instant was her obedience. We can safely say that this was most likely the pattern of her life. For 16 or 18 years, she had learned to obey Yahweh as she read the scriptures. And she knew that obedience to the word of God was the only way for peace and joy and contentment. The only way for her to bring pleasure to her God. The only way for her to bring glory to her God. And she dare not rob God of his glory by disobeying him. Her life was a sacrifice on the altar of God. Well, there's a second thing I want us to notice about Mary today, and that is her knowledge of the Word of God. Now, this fundamental truth stands out quite plainly when we realize that her song of praise here is modeled on... Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. There's a lot of parallels. You read Hannah's prayer. Let me read it to you. Hannah prayed. Remember, <clears throat> she'd been uh, unable to have children. She prayed and she got pregnant. She bore Samuel. She begins to praise God and she says, My heart exalts in the Lord. This is Hannah praying. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There's none holy like the Lord. Now, Mary's praise psalm said, Holy is his name. And she said, My soul magnifies the Lord. Hannah said, There's none besides you. There's no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. And Mary prayed or sang, He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. For the Lord God said, Hannah is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. But the feeble... Bind on strength, and Mary praised God. He said, He exalts those of humble estate. Hannah prayed, Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger, and so forth. If you follow that, there's a lot of similarity. It's pretty obvious that she was familiar with Hannah's prayer. Mm -hmm. So what does this tell us? It tells us that she knew the Word of God. 
that she had received, that she had absorbed it, and it has so much become a part of her that she breaks out in praise, pretty much following the model of Hannah's prayer. Just like we all know the Lord's Prayer by memory, and sometimes when we pray, we follow that model because it's so ingrained in our lives. I think this is what happened here. And so this shows us, I believe, I suggest that Mary, this is an example of she, how she was familiar, thoroughly familiar with the Word of God. Now, another interesting thing that shows us this is her mention uh, in Luke 1, verse 55. She says, He has spoken to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. So, this shows us that she knew the history of her people, that she knew about the Abrahamic covenant, and that she saw this as being fulfilled. The promise that the nations would be blessed through Abraham and that the nations would be blessed through his one seed. I just suspect that she understood that this prophecy of the seed to come would bless the nations is what she's referring to here. Well, <clears throat> Mary was evidently educated in the tradition of Jewish, the Jewish nation. A strong emphasis on educating children in the Word of God. You remember Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. The command, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you, Yahweh speaking, I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. So this is what pious Hebrew parents were to do with their children. To indoctrinate them in the word of God. And there's this, another example of this is in Nehemiah 8 when uh, the law was read to the people. And so it says in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 8, 22, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. So if a child was uh, old enough to understand Hebrew, he was there half a day listening to the Word of God being read. So this shows you that in the pious Hebrew tradition, the Word of God was taught to the children. Now, Mary was evidently a recipient of this serious, fundamental, thorough education in the Word of God. We can look in the New Testament and see the example of Timothy. His mother was a Jew. And Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.5, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. And then over in 2 Timothy 3.14 and 15, he says, As for you, Timothy, continue what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, your pious mother and grandmother, and how from childhood, or one translation says from infancy, You've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So, here in the New Testament era, we see Timothy that was thoroughly educated and indoctrinated by his mother and grandmother from an early age. 
And so he became a very mature young Christian. And Paul recruited him for the missionary work that, lied, that lay ahead of him. Well, I think it's pretty evident that Mary was one of these Hebrew young people who had been a beneficiary of this education in the scriptures from a very young age. Jesus knew the scriptures thoroughly. How did he learn the scriptures? Well, I think one of the chief instruments were his parents. They were godly people. They were pious people. And they would have educated him as well as their, his siblings in the word of God. Early education in the scriptures can have a tremendous effect on a child. Some of the most effective ministers in our own day are men who were raised in Christian homes and whose parents educated them in the scriptures and had a strong effect on their lives. So, the second thing about Mary is that her, she was a woman who was knowledgeable of the word of God. Now, a third thing I want us to know is her humility before God. Luke 1, 48 says, she's uh, speaking forth her psalm of praise to God. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord, verse 47. We call this the Magnificat. Uh, it's from the Latin word for magnifies. Magnifying the Lord. She magnified the Lord. The Magnificat. And he, why does she magnify the Lord? Verse 48 says, For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. She's referring to herself. She's describing herself. Mm -hmm. She's describing herself as a servant. Not some great person, but a servant. Even as Paul often described himself as a servant, a slave. And she says of herself, he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. She was a humble person. What do we mean when we say a person is humble? In the scriptural sense, we mean a person who understands who God is and who understands who they are in reference to God. They're nothing. They're sinful. They're lost. They're hopeless. They're undone. Unless God intervenes by His grace and mercy. And then to God be the praise. A humble person recognizes reality. Anything I have that's good, any characteristic, anything, is the result of the gift and the provision of God. And so a humble person recognizes this. He recognizes the value of humanity. He has courtesy and respect for other people knowing that God in His sovereignty has ordained the lives of all men and women. And we live under His supervision. So Mary had a servant heart. She was a humble person. She was not arrogant or prideful. She was humble before God and grateful for His mercy to her and to her people, to the Israeli nation. A fourth thing we notice about this young Jewish maiden is her joyful worship of God. She says in verse 46 and 47, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And then she lists various reasons why she's so... Uh, caught up in the praise of God because he's looked upon her humble estate. Because he's done such great things for her 
his mercy. And she, she begins to go from the particular to the general in verse 50. His mercy is for those who fear him, not only herself, but for anyone who fears him from generation to generation. Because what is God pleased with? He's pleased with humility for those who fear him, those who are prideful and arrogant. It says, he scattered, verse 51, he scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Well, he's brought down the mighty, but what? Verse 52, exalted those of humble estate. Oh, it's so wonderful to meet a man or woman with humility. It's so refreshing. This pleases God. A person who is humble before God and humble before people is a person who recognizes that every good gift comes from God. He's to be thanked and praised and to be served. And then, <clears throat> the last thing I want to say about Mary is that she knew she was a sinner in need of a Savior. Yes, she was humble and she was knowledgeable of Scripture. She was a joyful worshiper, but she knew she was a sinner. In spite of all these great attributes, she knew her only hope was in the mercy of God's saving grace. <clears throat> it says in verse 47, what is she magnifying God for? Why, why is she rejoicing? She's rejoicing in what? In God. How does she describe God? She describes Him as my Savior. She knew she needed a Savior. And so... She described God as her Savior. Throughout the Old Testament, time and again, we see that God is the Savior of His people from their sins. The whole Old Testament sacrificial system was set up to remind the Jews that they were sinners, that their sin needed to be paid for, the death of innocent animals at that time, which was a temporary uh, covering for their sin until the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, would come and His blood would remove their sins permanently. So, Mary <clears throat> recognizes that she was a sinful person and she needed a savior and she rejoiced in what God was doing here to bring about the salvation of his people. Mary was obedient to the will of the Lord. What a great example for us. Paul said that he preached the gospel to bring people to the obedience of faith. Yes, faith, but faith must issue forth in obedience or it's not true faith. <clears throat> obedience is the mark of the Christian. It's easy to say you're a Christian, but to be an obeying Christian is to be a true disciple. She was knowledgeable and the Word of God. See how much the Lord used her? And the more that we study the Word of God, the more we know the Word of God, the Lord can use us in His service. Besides just studying the Word of God to know Him better, to rejoice in Him, we also become more useful in his service, more equipped to bring the gospel to other people. She was a humble servant of God. Moses, it is said, was the most humble man in all the earth. 
He knew who Yahweh was. He knew who He was. He knew how strong the attraction of sin was among the people. And Moses was humble before God. Mary was a joyful worshiper of God because she understood all these great truths from the Scripture. She understood that without the mercy of Yahweh, there's no hope for anyone. And that he's pleased with those who fear him and are humble before him. And he brings down the prideful in their pride. And lastly, Mary rejoiced in Yahweh, her Redeemer, whose redemption would be made complete and final and sure. And the salvation that would ultimately come from her own son, who she was bearing in her womb at that time. So what a refreshing look it is today to see such a humble and godly young woman dedicated to her God and to fulfilling His will in her life and in the world. So even as Mary followed the Lord, let's follow her also. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this woman whom you shined upon with your grace, who responded in obedience to your calling upon her life, her life, although it would not be an easy calling. We thank you, Lord, that she studied, she knew, she understood your holy word, and she sought to fulfill it in her life. Help us, Lord, to study your word, to know it better, to have it worked out and its power in our lives. Even as Mary was a servant of yours, a humble servant, help us, Lord, to serve you in this life, to serve our brothers and sisters, to serve the needs of the world, and to serve with humble humbleness, with humility. Lord, even as Mary was such a joyful worshiper and praiser of you for all your grace and mercy to her and to your people. May we be the same kind of joyful worshipers in our lives. And Father, even as she knew she had to have a Savior to pay for her sins, may we, Lord, realize that and give thanks to you and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior from our sins. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> our hymn of response today is Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. This is what Mary was doing here in this psalm of praise. <clears throat> 
confess our faith, our Christian faith, in this section from the Nicene Creed, which deals with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the confession of the church <clears throat> since the fourth century. And all true Christian bodies gladly confess this faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And God's people said, Amen. Please be seated as Brother Wayne comes to lead us in our Christmas Eucharist service. <clears throat> 